Okay, glad to see all of you. Um, the two topics in this session are really the hottest topics in quantitative research methods over the last 20 or 30 years. There's a lot more to these than we can capture in our time allocated. And so don't expect to become an expert by the end of this session. That will not happen unless you already are. But we'll provide the basics of these two methods. And so first up, I'm looking at structural equation modeling. And so basically, what is it in a nutshell? It's a, a way to test theoretical models in a quantitative fashion. And so basically, the researcher hypothesizes that certain variables are related in certain ways and then goes ahead and tests that theoretical model. And so here are just a few examples from some different disciplines of some really super basic models just to get started with something. And so for instance, you might have home environment influences achievement or consumer trust influences product sales or really sophisticated model diet and exercise have some impact on the risk of heart attack. And so sort of the bottom line question in SEM is, is the theoretical model that we desire to test supported by the data? And as, as will become evident, coming up with a model is essentially the hard part of SEM in that you have to do it yourself or you have to borrow a model from somewhere else. It's not a, that part of it modeling is not software driven, that's brain driven. And so it's based on whatever theories and previous research are out there. And so just real quickly, there's four kinds of variables that are involved in SEM or could be involved in SEM. First, we have latent variables. Latent variables are constructs, they're unmeasurable, they're theoretical entities. And so, for instance, we might have intelligence as a psychological construct, consumer confidence as an economic construct, or fitness as a health-related construct. Those are not measurable as such, but they're theoretical constructs that we use all the time. And then, of course, if that's all we had, we wouldn't be able to do very much. And so we have observed variables, and so these are actual measures of those latent variables of those constructs. And so we don't often think of it this way, but observed variables are designed to measure those contract constructs in a particular way based on what the developer had in mind. And so for instance, we have the whole bevy of Wexler intelligence scales as one sort of measure of intelligence, although there are many others out there. The Dow Jones is a measure of the economy. Blood pressure is one measure of fitness. These two types of variables are inherent in most methods that are out there quantitatively, so nothing new here really. There's a little bit of a wrinkle in, it, in SEM. An independent variable is a variable that influences something else but is not influenced by others versus a dependent variable is influenced by some other variable in the model. That's the difference. And so this is the same whether it's a latent or an observed variable, so to speak. So for instance, if we go back to those three very basic examples, the way I've drawn them there, the variables on the left would be independent variables. In this case, they'd be independent latent variables. And the variables on the right would be dependent latent variables. Uh, just kind of a quick run through of the four basic models in SEM and then a little bit at the end before Kim drags me away about some advanced models. Uh, the diagrams here are from the literal software, which we'll mention software in a little bit. So here we have regression models. This is sort of the standard nomenclature in terms of how path diagrams are drawn. Squares or boxes signify observed variables. Circles or ellipses signify latent variables. Those will come up in a second. So I don't know how well you can see this. We've got on the left two independent variables, family income and quantitative ability. They in turn influence quantitative achievement. And then there's some error term here, 
which is likely to be huge given that there's not much in the model. Over to the left, those two independent variables are allowed to be correlated, and so that's the curved line with an arrow at each end. That just signifies those independent variables are correlated, meaning there's something outside of the model that influences each of those but is not shown. Um, issues with regression models, we cannot have sophisticated models. <laughs> so these are all one equation models in, in, the, in the abstract. Measurement error is not taken into account. And so if our measure of quantitative ability is flawed in that it's not the most reliable and most valid measure, that's not taken into account. That's part of the model, and so that's going to influence any results that come out of the model to some degree. There'll be some bias there. And regression's been around for a few hundred years. Path models, a little more sophisticated. It allows for multiple independent and multiple dependent variables, and so we can have more than one equation. And so in this case, there are two equations. One equation is each of the three variables influences quantitative achievement, and two of the variables influence educational aspirations, and so there are two error terms. And so now we've ramped it up to two equations, but still it's an observed only variable model, and so measurement error cannot be taken into account. Now we introduce latent variables, and so here we have one of two sort of standard forms. Confirmatory factor analysis models are often utilized when we're sort of trying to determine the structure of some instrument. And so in this case, we have two latent variables, home background and ability. And so again, as I said earlier, latent variables are typically denoted by circles or ellipses. And then we have two and, two and three measures, respectively, of each of those. And so now we're taking measurement error into account in that we have multiple measures of home background, which would be, assuming they're decent measures, we would have a better assessment of that construct than if we just had a single measure, like family income, which was in the previous model. And to the right there, Again, we're allowing these two latent variables to be correlated if that's something that you think might be relevant. And if we put all that together, we have sort of a full SEM model. That is, we have observed variables, latent variables, independent variables, dependent variables, multiple measures, et cetera. And so now we can take measurement into it error into account, we can have multiple measures of each latent variable, and the latent variables can be related to one another in whatever fashion you desire. And there's no limit to the complexity of this. This is just what fits on the screen. So why do we do SEM? Well, most methods out there are not sophisticated enough to handle lots of variables and not sophisticated enough to handle measurement error. And so as we know, over time, any field that we study, the theories that are out there become more and more complex, and we need methods that can handle those. And so, for instance, regression is not equipped to handle really sophisticated models. And so in terms of testing theoretical models, this is sort of the way to do it now in a latent variable sense. And again, measurement error is a, an important piece of this so that we can take into account the lack of reliability and validity that we might have in our measures. There aren't too many measures out there that one thinks of as gold standard measures that are essentially perfect. And so height and weight might be closest to that, but most educational and psychological measures are fraught with, me with measurement error to some degree. Uh, the software's come a long way. Lizerol started in 1973 out of ETS. So we can do a lot more complex things than we used to be able to. 
Uh, we're past mainframes, and so now we're using very user-friendly software. These are sort of the big four SEM software packages. I won't say anything about them, and I won't recommend any of them. They all have their strengths and limitations, as you might expect. That's a whole other discussion. So I want to talk about how do we do SEM? What are the steps in the process? And so the first phase is what's called model specification. That is, you know, where does this model come from? And so again, it doesn't come from your software. It comes from whatever is available. Theories that people pose, perhaps not, but not tested. Uh, you may be testing theoretical models that, that have already been tested in other, other disciplines or in other nations. And so as, as my advisor said, this is the hard part of SEM because there's no, you know, you just have to gut it out. This is the part I like. This, to me, this separates SEM from most other methods in that you have to know something about what you're studying. This is not number crunching. If you don't know what you're studying, you can't do SEM, period. Most other methods, I have a data set. I pop a few variables in a few boxes. I get some output. I don't have to know anything about the variables. I've seen people present their dissertations where they had no idea what the variables are all about. You can't do that here. In other words, you have to propose the model. That's the input to the software in addition to the data. No model, no input. And it's probably a good idea to be thinking about what your model looks like even before you select your measures, because that way that will guide you in terms of selecting what are the best measures that are available. Rather than I have this crappy data set, I have this latent variable that I think is really cool. I want to model it. I don't have very good measures. I'm stuck. And so planning is useful in that sense. So in terms of how to do model specification, which variables are in the model, which variables are not in the model. And then the variables that are in the model, how they're related. And so all that has to be specified. You can't say, well, I don't know. I'll just see. Well, you might be testing models until, you know, 2016. Uh, the data that's actually analyzed in SEM is the sample covariance matrix that's, you know, previously comes from the raw data. And so this sample covariance matrix, which is the unstandardized relationships among the variables, comes from some true model. We don't know what it is. That's what we're trying to model. But the, but the data were generated by some true model, and we're trying to figure out what that model might be. And so we're looking to find a model that reproduces that covariance matrix as best as possible. The closer those are, the more, as we say, the more properly specified your theoretical model is. That is, the closer your, model, your theoretical model is to the true model, the more properly specified it is, the better the fit of the model will be, and so forth. The further you get away, the more the model's misspecified. You're missing important relationships, important variables, etc. Misspecified models result in parameter estimates that are somewhat biased. If you've missed some really key variable, then the explanatory power of that variable is missing. And so that's going to change the other estimates that are in your model. Of course, it Sort of the caveat to all is every model is misspecified to some degree, no matter what, at least in this century. Stage two is model identification. And so this is one that people don't really think too much about, but it's kind of crucial. Given the data that we have and the model we're interested in testing, can we obtain a unique set of parameter estimates? So if I want to know what's the real influence of x on y, and I run my model with my data, do I get a particular estimate every time I run it? If the answer is no, then I can't trust the results. 
And so a lame example from ninth grade algebra would be x plus y equals 75. There's an infinite number of solutions. And so that's not going to be very satisfying. Because every time I run the data, I get a different answer. In SEM, every potential parameter, whether it's in your model or not, is one of three types. A free parameter, those are parameters I'm interested in estimating. So I will get a, an estimate of that parameter. Fixed parameters are parameters I'm fixing to some specified value. In other words, I'm not interested in them. If I'm really not interested, I'd fix that parameter to be zero. In some contexts, I have to fix parameters to be equal to one. We won't get into that today. And then more sophisticated models, we might have constrained parameters. That is, the parameters fixed to be equal to some other parameter. And we might do that, for instance, if we're looking at two samples and we want to fix the parameters in sample one to be equal to those in sample two, perhaps. For a model to be identified, we have to be, we have to be able to come up with a unique solution to every parameter. Otherwise, I can't trust anything. So again, you have to know what you're doing. You might get an output, but it might not be trustworthy. And so you have to know when it's trustworthy and when it's not. In terms of identification, there's sort of three basic levels. We have an under-identified model. Those are models where we don't have enough information to uniquely estimate every parameter. In other words, you know, we can't proceed. One way to know that is if you run your model and you have negative degrees of freedom, then you can throw that output away. Just identified model is exactly what you might think. There's just enough information in the data to estimate uniquely every parameter. But if we wanted to estimate one more parameter, we're out of luck. And so here the degrees of freedom would be zero. And so if we wish to modify the model and add one more parameter, we can't do it. And so that's not, that's satisfactory, but not a pretty sight actually, because we, we can't move from there. And so our preference is an over-identified model where we have more than enough information to uniquely estimate every parameter. We have some positive amount of degrees of freedom. If we choose to modify the model and include some additional parameters, fine. We have some wiggle room to go from. I'm not going to say anything about model estimation. There are different methods of estimating parameters as there are with most statistics. And so that's for another day. Uh, model testing, there's sort of two levels of testing models. One is at the global level, in other words, the fit of the entire model. And so that's certainly something of interest. We want to know, does the entire model fit the data well, or what degree does it fit the model? Unfortunately, unlike some other stats, we, there's no single best uh, fit statistic. And so like when we do ANOVA or regression, you know, F or R or R squared or something like that are sort of the standard measures of fit that everybody uses. We don't have that in SEM. So there's a whole bevy of, I don't know how many, we're up to 70-some fit statistics now. Depending on the software you use, you get different ones. So again, that's, that's a whole other hour, but, but my recommendation always is report multiple fit indices. That way you get a better sense of fit who's ever reviewing your work and say, oh, I can identify that's one of my favorite ones that you picked, and so they're okay with it. If you just pick one and that's not anyone else's favorite, then that's a problem. So just report bunches of them. Then we have assessment of fit at the parameter level. In other words, we want to know at the parameter level how things are, pro how things are progressing. And so, for instance, for each, for each free parameter, we get a t-value, like we do in other methods, basically the estimate divided by the standard error. And we also get a significance of each of those. So we get a p-value, and so we know if each of our free parameters are statistically different from zero. There's a sign attached to those. We want to know, is it in the right direction? And so, for instance, I don't know, a couple times a year, 
I'll be working with someone. They'll be all excited about some, you know, parameter that's significantly different from zero. It's significant in the wrong direction, and so that's that's like the worst possible result. There's nothing to be excited about. You'd be better off if it was if it was not significant. And so that has to be also part of your hypothesis. You know, what is the expected direction of the relationship? Not it's significant. Whoop de doo. If kids' achievement is lower as a result of your intervention, that's not a, a good finding. And then whether the estimate makes sense. Occasionally you'll see output where you might have like a variance term that's negative, which is theoretically impossible, or correlations bigger than one, which is theoretically impossible, but these occur. So you have to pay attention to the output to know that something is wrong here. Then the last stage is model modification. Typically, the fit of your initial model is not as acceptable as you would like. And so then the question is, what do we do about it? And so there's a, very, uh, a set of procedures for looking at um, ways in which you might modify the model to achieve a better fit. We call this a specification search. And so we're looking for sort of clues in the results that say, perhaps this relationship should be taken out of the model and a different relationship should go in the model, just as an example. And so imagine, this is not very high-tech graphics, imagine there's a continuum there from the true model that actually generated the covariance matrix to on the right, the model you're actually testing. And so there's, some, there's always some distance there between your model and the, the, the real model. And that distance is reflected in the fit of your model. And so the less consistent those two models, that indicates the more more that the model you're testing is misspecified. In other words, doesn't map onto the true model as well as it might. Now here I have to give warnings. And so before people go crazy and look at the output and say, oh, there's like 36 more parameters that if I put in the model, the fit will be really good. And I say, yeah, it will be. But do those parameters, 36 parameters, make any sense? And so in terms of making any model modifications, we have to keep in mind subset of knowledge again, because that's where we started at the beginning when we developed our model. And so we don't want this to lapse into a number crunching exercise with our efforts at the beginning to not do that. That's easy to do, not a good idea. So if there's some parameter that looks like if you include it, the fit of your model is going to be awesome, and you can explain that parameter, it doesn't make any sense, then you don't put it in there. It's as simple as that. Because as I always say, you know, you have to explain that to your reader. And if you can't explain a parameter, if, if it doesn't map onto existing literature, then, you know, you're just crunching numbers. Uh, here are sort of a bevy of examples. Not that my own work is better than anyone else, but you know, I own the copyright, or somebody owns the copyright on these. <laughs> and so this is sort of a variety of models in different disciplines that use some of different kinds of models over, the, over my career. So here we have one modeling second language acquisition. And so really, most of these are just theoretical models. I've not indicated on these figures the results, except I think one toward the end. But in a paper, this might be something you'd put at the end of the lit review to indicate what the model is. And so to me, in an SEM study, the purpose of the lit review is to substantiate the model. Where did the model come from? And so if I see a model and I don't know, you know, it seems like some bird whispered it in the researcher's ear, you know, that's an easy reject if I'm reviewing your manuscript because the model doesn't come from anything real. And so you might have something like this sort of at the beginning of your paper and then you might map onto this the estimates and whatever else you want to present later on in the results section of the paper. Uh, here's one looking at parent efficacy. 
in the case of this model, there are a couple observed variables only. And so age, you know, we don't need six measures of age. You know, we have gold standard measures of age like birth certificates. Now all these that have latent variables, they all have multiple observes in there. They're just not shown for simplicity's sake. So there's several measures of this latent variable. They're just not shown here. And that's pretty typical because otherwise the model gets so complicated it takes up two journal pages and they're not going to be too happy about that. Uh, this is a model of exercise behavior. It's based on the Fishbein model, which has attitude, intention, and subjective norms. So you've probably seen that in lots of different disciplines. Again, there are observed measures of each of these, just not shown. School safety, schooling. This particular one, I was looking at multiple samples, and so there was, I was comparing schooling in public and private schools, and there were sub substantial differences. I was also look, modeling mean structure differences there. Uh, this one has some results in it. This is sort of a full-blown one of, of motivation. Print. Uh, simple view of reading. This is the, the last thing I've done. Just to show you, in this particular case, this was a multiple sample model. The observed variables, again, are not shown, but these values here, these are the estimates for three different grades. So you have first grade, inference, second grade, third grade. And so that's just a way of showing the results from multiple samples in the same figure. Now, there are a lot of advanced models that I have, what, three minutes and 30 seconds to talk about, and I would need about three weeks. And so I'll just give a quick overview. Model validation is important. It's important in all methods, quant and qualitative. People usually forget about it, but are your results sample specific, or can they be validated in some other sample? According to the scientific method, that's where we should be going. And so we want things that can be verified. And so there are statistical techniques that can do that, such as using multiple sample SEM, cross-validation, bootstrapping, et cetera. Multiple sample SEM is a favorite area of mine because we can look at, for instance, do we, does the same model result in three different countries or males and females or different grades or et cetera? We can also look at mean differences. We can model mean differences as well as the covariance structure. And so these models have, are quite flexible. Different CFA models, multi-trait, multi-method models, mimic models, mixture models where we have variables, some of which are ordinal and some of which are interval and ratio variables. And so we can handle that multi-level models, which leads into what Anne's going to be talking about, but we can do multi-level SEM. We can include interaction terms in models, so we could have an interaction latent variable, for instance. Those are becoming more popular. Latent growth models have become pretty popular in terms of looking at longitudinal change over time. And so these are more sophisticated. They've sort of come along later in the development of all these software programs. Simulation methods where we generate data and have fun with Christian. Um, just some for further information, I've, I've had a book forever on SEM. It's sitting up here. And I've had a course forever. And I'll be doing it in the spring to which is when I typically do that course. And so what you've gotten is what I do in about the first half hour of a 16-week course. <laughs> and so you have another 15 and a half weeks that, you've, that you're missing out on. So I, I, I think it's probably best if we wait until the end to have questions, because I don't want to shortchange Ann out of her time. OK, so um, my portion of the workshop is going to talk about 
multi-level models in general. Um, I also teach a semester-long course on HLM, so this is just a snapshot, perhaps, of some of the topics that we cover in that course. Um, I also have uh, uh, several books and articles on HLM, the, um, and the picture above me is of my colleague, Betsy McCoach. I've learned a lot from Betsy over many years, and so I acknowledge, like to acknowledge uh, her when I can. She was one of my former students, but we've done a lot of work together since our initial um, efforts. Uh, so what are multi-level models? These are uh, methods that capture the hierarchical structure of data. So they're designed to really represent that clustered structure of data. Some examples of that are when we collect data from children who are nested within families, um, when we collect data from students who are nested within classrooms or schools. Those are examples of, say, two-level models. We could also have data collected from clients who are nested within programs within specific community organizations. So that would be an example of three-level data. Um, repeated measures or community trials or even meta-analysis can also be conceived of as hierarchical in nature. So multi-level models, their goal is to really model that structure. Uh, the reason it's important to model that structure is because there's a property called homogeneity that occurs within um, clusters of the same type. So say within families, children tend to be more similar to each other than they are to children in another family. Within classrooms, students tend to be more similar on an outcome in their own classroom relative to either a simple random sample or students from another classroom. So the process that that um, leads to is, is homogeneity or similarity within those groups. And that when we apply typical regression or analysis of variance models to that kind of data and ignore the fact that those clustered pieces of information are related, then the standard errors from those parameter estimates, like a regression coefficient, tend to be very, very small, which means that we'd always be rejecting our null hypothesis, which may not really be the case if we had adjusted for the cluster nature of the data. So the precision um, is actually enhanced when we have clustered data because that clustering is taken into account. Uh, that homogeneity or the clustering effect, uh, we measured as a correlation, and it's called, referred to as ICC. Sometimes it's called RO, which is, uh, you know, somewhat of an acronym for rate of homogeneity. So it really assesses the clustering that occurs within families, within hospitals, within schools, within classrooms. Um, it's referred to as the intraclass correlation coefficient, or ICC. It tells us two pieces of information. It tells us how much of the variation in the outcome of interest lies between groups. But it also tells us, the exact same number, tells us the um, rate of correlation, the correlation between two randomly selected people from the same cluster. So if the correlation is very high, that means there's a lot of shared information in the outcomes for those people. Uh, the ICC is relative to an outcome measure. Like you could get a different ICC for the same sample of people on a reading score versus a math score. So it's not a sample specific measure, it's more like a measure, uh, a measure specific measure, an outcome specific measure. And the existence of this ICC, even if it's very, very small, can um, violate the assumption of independence that we typically make when we're using a uh, simple uh, single level regression models or ANOVA models. And even small violations can lead to severe problems with type 1 error, so that those, uh, t the type 1 error rate is typically inflated. We're rejecting much more often than we should be. This is a graphic of two-level structure. On my screen, oh no, I thought I had little red schoolhouses on there, but that must have been a different slide. So we have, um, say, J schools, and then I have students nested within those schools. So that's what the data kind of looks like. Note that um, you don't have to have a balanced design. I can have different numbers of kids per school. Um, I can extend that to a three-level structure, like what if I had those schools nested within um, a smaller number of districts. So these examples are a pure hierarchy. 
one student can only be in one school, can only be in one district. But we could have a cross-classified structure where we're also able to capture um, the contribution of schools on a student's achievement or the contribution of neighborhoods, say, on a student's achievement. You can see that, um, for example, say student E uh, is in neighborhood I but goes to school two, and student F goes to school two but came from a different neighborhood. So we can use multi-level modeling to, to isolate um, the separate contribution of neighborhoods and the separate contribution of schools to um, student outcomes. Okay, so this is a cross-classified hierarchy rather than a pure hierarchy. Longitudinal data also can be conceptualized as a hierarchy where we have different observations nested within people. And in a longitudinal model, we can consider the people as different contexts just like we could in a, in a school or organizational sample, we consider the schools as different contexts or classrooms as different contexts. So contexts or clusters we can think of as replications of one another that are sampled from some larger population of clusters. Those clusters could be schools, they could be neighborhoods, they could be hospitals, they could be community organizations. The question is really whether or not the relationships that we're interested in are the same within each of those clusters. We'd like to be able to quantify any differences that might occur in the relationships we're interested in across those different clusters. Like we'd like to know if patient outcomes are the same in different hospitals. And if they're not, what is it about the hospitals that might inform a better understanding of why those outcomes are different? Same with schools. We might want to know why um, school achievement, I'm sorry, why student achievement is different across a collection of schools. And if we can identify that they are different, are there school variables that could help us understand why those outcomes are different? Uh, so multi-level data really helps us um, clarify how person variables, that could be gender, could be um, behavior, could be prior knowledge about a topic, and cluster level variables, which could be, say, school characteristics, classroom characteristics, teacher characteristics, hospital characteristics, how all of those help to explain some outcome of interest. And that outcome of interest is measured at that lower level, so at the student level, at the patient level. And there could also be interactions that occur between levels. Well, we could have interactions within a level, but we could also have interactions between levels, which really are much more interesting, because then we could look to see are there specific school variables that interact on the relationship between you know, some variable of interest and the outcome. Those are called cross-level interactions. And they really tell us what the relationship is or the contribution of um, a context-level variable or cluster-level variable is to explaining what's happening with individual data. A lot of words, but I have some examples coming up that might help clarify the language I'm using. So these um, cross-level interactions are characteristics of the uh, higher level settings that might contribute to those individual outcomes. What we really are interested in, how those relationships we might be measuring vary depending on or conditional on those classroom characteristics. I'm going to show you a really, really simple example. All of my students are probably going to close their eyes and nap for a couple minutes because this is the primary example that's demonstrated in most multi-level classrooms. But this is data from high school and beyond. And high school and beyond, the goal of that data set for this example is to look at the effect of socioeconomic status on math achievement. We have about 7,000 kids and they're in 160 schools. So we're interested in looking at whether or not that relationship between SES and math achievement is the same across those 160 schools. Is it the same or is it different? And if the relationship is different, then how are they different? Are there ways we can, are there variables that can help us explain why they're different? Okay. So this is just a sample of 10 different schools. I ran some uh, single level regressions, ordinary least squares regressions for these 10 schools, trying to predict math achievement from socioeconomic status. So one thing we can all see is that that relationship is positive. 
Okay. So the um, larger a child's family SES is, the prediction for higher math achievement will increase. Okay. And um, across these 10 schools, do you think this, this graph shows evidence of those relationships being the same or different? Different. They're not exactly the same. The intercepts are very different. Okay, so some schools actually have a higher intercept than other schools. And the slopes are not the same. They're not exactly parallel. That difference might be small, but they're not exactly parallel. Okay, and the intercepts here are, you know, SES is scaled, so zero is somewhere here. The intercept in any regression model is what our prediction is for the outcome when that x variable is zero. Okay. So when SES is zero, which is like at the average over all 7,000 kids, the prediction for math achievement is still different across these schools. So I want to know if I could describe each school in terms of their intercept and their slope, you know, the slope is the relationship between SES and math achievement. Can I find some external variables, maybe some school level variables, to try and explain why are the intercepts different in some schools? Uh, I'm sorry, why are the intercepts higher in some schools versus lower? Why are the slopes stronger in some schools versus others? In this next slide, I used a red line for uh, uh, private schools and a blue line for public schools. And so now we can see a different kind of pattern that emerges based on this context variable, what we call school sector, whether the school is a public school or a private school. And here you can see that the red lines, the private schools, um, well, you tell me, what, what do you see about the intercepts, say, between these two groups of schools? Say for the same SES level of zero, intercepts tend to be higher in the private schools than they do in the public schools. And what about the slopes? A little bit weaker. The, in, the slopes tend to be a little bit weaker in, in private schools than they are in public schools. Okay, so in a public school, the effect of your family SES is much stronger. I'm exaggerating that because it's very slight, but it is stronger in public schools. Okay? So that, that is what HLM affords us the capacity to do, is to quantify those differences in the intercepts and those differences in the slopes across this sample of schools. So we can see that the slopes and the intercepts can vary, and our research questions in multi-level analyses tend to focus on those level two variables, those cluster level variables, that can help explain those differences. Okay? And that's what typically tends to be of value, trying to understand differences in the relationships that are occurring at that lower level. Okay. Longitudinal data, really we can treat the exact same way. In longitudinal data, we're thinking of each person as a different group or context, sampled from a much larger population of people. And then the repeated measures that we collect from within the same person, those become the, um, the lower level observations. So the outcome and the occasions are level one variables and the person characteristics are level two variables. So we're looking to see how gender might change the rate of change over time for reading growth, something like that. So it's all about variability in the relationships and understanding variability in the relationships. And to understand that variability, we have to be able to measure that variation and see how it changes from, say, model to model. Um, and just a little bit more language here. Conditional models are models that include some uh, higher level predictor, like sector or gender in a longitudinal model. So we're conditioning our predictions based on a little bit more information, what we know either about a person or the school that they came from. And HLM, multi-level modeling, provides that methodology for connecting all those levels together. I picked a couple research examples um, just to show you some of the ways that multi-level modeling is used in, a, in current research. So the first example is on a uh, 
uh, study of neighborhood context and cognitive decline for elderly Americans. And these were from the Hispanic EPESE longitudinal study. The question was how neighborhood context relates to cognitive function, function for older Mexican Americans. This paper actually ran three multi-level analyses. First, they looked just at how neighborhood variables impacted baseline cognitive functioning. And then they used a three-level model to look at individual growth over time. And actually, they're looking at cognitive decline. So growth is a kind of catch-all phrase for either positive or negative change. Okay, so the three-level model, we have time at level one, then person characteristics at level two, and then neighborhood characteristics at level three. And the important neighborhood characteristics that were present in this study or that were measured in this study were um, economic disadvantage, which is socioeconomic status at the neighborhood level, and percent of Mexican Americans in that neighborhood, which was taken as a measure of social disadvantage. So the fewer number of, or the fewer percent of other Mexican Americans in your neighborhood, the uh, more disadvantaged you are in terms of your social structure. And um, they, this analysis also looked at um, a, long, a logistic model where they're just looking at uh, cognitive decline, yes or no, rather than trying to measure it with a scale over time. So these researchers found that about 16% of the variation in decline is actually between neighborhoods, which is, you know, pretty... Uh, sizable in terms of neighborhood effects, okay? There's still a lot of individual variation in those um, variables, but 16% can be explained by what neighborhood the person came from. And that's true even after controlling for individual level predictors. So the cognitive decline was faster among Mexican Americans in low SES neighborhoods, and it was also um, the odds of decline increased as the percent of other Mexican Americans in your neighborhood decreased. So there was a social disadvantage as well. Um, so for Mexican Americans, neighborhood context matters. And that's a very, you know, it's th only through multi-level modeling that we can actually get a reliable estimate of neighborhood effects like that. Um, the second example I selected is, uh, focuses on obesity of children. Um, this was actually a paper I worked on with one of my graduate students a while ago, a shared graduate student with Dr. Lomax. Um, we looked at the school and individual and family characteristics, including diet quality, that were associated with students' economic achievement. And we actually looked at retrospective trends. So we weren't, we fit growth models, but we weren't actually making any causal claims about that growth. We were only looking retrospectively at what happened over time for these kids. We used the nutritional supplement in grade five of the ECLSK, that's the early childhood longitudinal study. And you can even see on these graphs, that we, we separated out by fast food consumption into six categories, that at grade five, those kids who reported no fast food consumption had much higher reading and math scores and slightly elevated slopes relative to kids on the bottom who reported eating fast food every day. So it was a really very interesting um, result, I think, that we, we were able to isolate through multi-level modeling. So we saw that even after adjusting for BMI status, which also changes over time, so we included that as what we'd call a time-variant covariate, um, there was a, a link between more frequent high-calorie food intake, or fast food, and children's weaker academic achievement trends. Um, these results are still controlling for individual and school socioeconomic status, and while they're not causal, they clearly suggest some important trends between diet and, uh, and cognitive development for U.S. kids. The ECLSK is about 20,000 U.S. kids in their sample. And the next um, article that I wanted to share with you looks at, um, this is a health-related study, so we're looking at facility volume. That's the number of patients that come into a hospital with a certain um, uh, disease or condition. 
and patient-centered outcomes for inpatient rehab centers. And we looked at stroke and fracture outcomes for these uh, patients. Uh, we created these quintiles for patient volume served. So we had like a large volume served hospital and low volume served hospital. And we're looking at patient outcomes in, um, across those different hospitals. So those hospitals then are the, are the clusters. We're controlling for similarity within each of those clusters. Um, this data came from a very large data system on a medical rehabilitation. So we had quite a few people, 200,000 people in this particular sample. And how many hospitals? 717 hospitals. And what we found was that higher volume quintiles did admit people with lower functional status. So they were more able to admit an, uh, people with a variety of levels of their um, uh, um, disease or whatever they're dealing with, and relative to lower volume quintiles. The length of stay increased for all three diagnostic groups with greater volume hospitals. And essentially, we found that higher volume stroke and fracture facilities tended to admit more clinically complex patients because they had the resources to do that. But that leads actually to poorer predicted outcomes. So controlling for the fact that the patients coming in are different than they would at a lower volume hospital, we were able to kind of tease out that relationship and identify relatively low performing and higher performing facilities. So again, most of these analyses were, um, we used uh, HLM for continuous outcomes and, and uh, logistic regression for dichotomous outcomes. But um, controlling for the similarity of patients within the rehab centers, we were still able to adjust for or um, estimate some of those effects. So in all three of those examples, um, we were looking at differences across clusters or those higher level units by simultaneously modeling relationships at level one and relationships at level two or three for three level models. Okay, so the idea for HLM is to actually model all of those relationships simultaneously at the same time. How much time do I have now, Kim? Seven minutes. Okay, so I have on the pages that follow, I have kind of a walkthrough example of a multi-level analysis, which I know I won't possibly be able to, to cover, but my goal was to kind of talk through each of these pieces of information that are part of the um, multi-level modeling process. So while I won't get to everything, I'll just talk here briefly about a couple of, of issues. Uh, Dr. Lomax had said earlier about model specification not being something that the computer tells you. That's clearly quite true as well for um, multi-level modeling and most other analyses. So you need to have an understanding of what you're looking at before you sit down and run any of these analyses. If you have been in my course, you know that um, it's very easy to click on a button that says, oh, give me this, and oh, I think I'll ask for that next, without really knowing what you're doing. It's very dangerous, I think. Sometimes I long for the days where people had to really think and write syntax and pay attention to what they were doing, because now anybody can do this. Um, so I would just caution you to, to really think through the relationships you seek before you sit down and actually model anything. Scaling or recentering, I know on the handouts people sent back to Kimberly um, earlier in the week, that was a big question. It's a whole day for me to basically try to explain that. I did share some resources in the handout on that and talked through a little bit more. But basically, it goes back to how we want to interpret the intercept. When we talked earlier for high school and beyond about the intercept being, you know, the prediction for um, achievement, math achievement, when SES is zero, I'm talking about SES being at the middle or the grand mean for the entire sample. So that's an idea of recentering. In a lot of variables we might be interested in, say, self-esteem doesn't always come with a natural zero. So we can center that variable or just rescale it 
so that zero represents the middle or some value that does matter to us. And that way, when we think about the intercept, we're talking about the intercept at that value that matters to us most. Um, so that's the basic idea about centering. Um, and I want to move on a, a little bit, but most of this is also in the handout, and you can ask me questions about any of that later on as well. So this was the illustration of HLM. I used data, again, from the Early Childhood Longitudinal Study. 2,408 students in 169 schools, and I was looking at reading assessment. These are three child-level variables that I selected. Um, gender, number of family risks, so the higher the number of family risks, the um, generally the poorer the outcomes. These might be having non-English speaking parents or uh, receiving free or reduced lunch. So there's a collection of, say, risk variables that we combined into this number of risk variables. And then family socioeconomic status. So those are child level variables predicting reading outcomes. And then we have some school level variables predicting reading outcomes. These are um, the uh, severity of, of, say, crime, trash, a disarray in the neighborhood. That's what we call neighborhood problems. So the higher that measure of neighborhood problems, uh, the uh, more disadvantaged that neighborhood is. And then we had school socioeconomic status, so just an average of SES for the kids within a school. And we also used public and private. Okay, just like high school and beyond. So we had three child level variables, three school level variables. Move through that, and I want to just show you first an ordinary least squares model. Okay, so this is a single level regression model, no adjustment for clustering of kids within schools. Okay, and you can see that based on this model, predicting reading achievement from socioeconomic status, number of family risks, and gender. We can see that uh, all of them are statistically significant. Okay. All of those effects are statistically significant. Of course, this is 2,000 kids, so it's probably not really that unusual that that would happen. But um, for this data, um, this is the end of spring, first grade. Uh, all of those variables are statistically significant. So I took this model, and I actually ran this now as a multi-level regression where I actually controlled for the clustering of children within particular schools. Okay? So you can see that at level one, I have the exact same model, right, as I did on the previous slide, right? But at level two, now to control for that clustering, I actually allow those slopes, the effect of SES on reading achievement, the effect of family risks on reading achievement, the effect of gender on reading achievement, I allow those to vary across schools. Okay? That's what's happening here. These now are at level two. So at level one, I have just a familiar regression. And at level two, I'm taking all of that, the intercept, and all of the slopes for those variables. And I'm actually allowing them to vary. So it's, if I have 100, well, how many schools do I have here? I can't remember. 169 schools. So if I have 169 schools, I actually have 169 intercepts, 169 slopes for SES, 169 slopes for family risk. And I'm, I really just want to see, are those numbers, are those estimates all the same? Are all schools having the same relationship, or do they differ? Okay. If they're all the same, then all of those gammas would be exactly the same. I can't reach high enough, or I'd hide those. All the gammas would be exactly the same number for every school, but if they differ, they're going to differ by some amount. The u naught j or the U1J is the amount that they'll differ by school. The little subscript J tells me how much it differs by school. So if those re residuals, or if those, we call them random effects, if those random effects are really large, that means that for that variable or for the intercept, there's a lot of difference across the 169 schools. If those residuals are very small, there's not much difference in that 
um, slope or in that intercept across the schools. So in this expression, this whole model, this whole thing is the model. Uh, the fixed effects are those gammas, and the random effects are the residuals. Residual at level one just says how much difference is there within any particular school, just on the kids. And the U's are how much difference is there in the intercepts and the slopes across all 169 schools. So you kind of have to keep in mind what's happening here. We have uh, 2,000 kids, so there's 2,000 residuals from level one, but there's only 169 schools, so there's 169 residuals for the intercept, 169 residuals for the, each of the slopes. So they're not the exact same number at different levels. When I fit this model, Okay, this is really, it's technically the same model as that ordinary least squares model, but now I'm allowing for differences across the intercepts and the slopes. I see very similar um, coefficients, okay? And those coefficients are still statistically significant, but um, they're not really as strong as what we saw in the previous model. We also see information about the variance. This is the variability in all of those residuals. So the re variation in the residuals, the RIJ, that were at level one, that's 118. Okay, that's the variance in those um, residuals. I need to scroll back here really quick. The reading variance was 167 overall. What was the... 12.94 was a standard deviation. So you, just to have a comparison there for that 118. And then the variance in the intercepts and the three slopes are measured by these variances here. Basically use the same formula that we're familiar with in you know, regression 101. How do you find the variance if I give you a set of scores? That's what's happening here. They're not all on the same metric, so you're not comparing size across say the intercept relative to the slope. You're just saying, if my measure of the variability in the intercepts is 30, is that number bigger than zero? The asterisks next to it tell me, yes, it is. So I know that those intercepts vary across schools. And I also know that the slopes vary across schools. That's the effect of SES, controlling for or adjusting any of the other variables in the model. And the same for, whoops. Same for number of family risks and same for gender. Actually, I'm, I am speaking without really reading what I'm saying. And I meant to say that the number of family risks, this is not significantly different from zero. Okay, so there's not a lot of variability in the effect of number of family risks on the children's reading achievement. And there's not a lot of variability in the effect of being female on reading achievement. That doesn't say that there's no effect of number of family risks or gender. It just says that the differences across schools is similar. Okay? Because if I look at the fixed effect for number of family risks, I see that there is a strong negative effect. As the number of family risks increases, <coughs> reading tends to decrease. Controlling for the other variables, same for gender. Um, you know, Female was coded with a one for female, zero for male. So for females, the reading coefficient goes up about 2.29 points for females relative to males. Two minutes. Okay. So that's a general snapshot of HLM and the value of looking at variability at that second level. So I want to show you one more thing that I did after this model is given that we have variation in the intercepts and variation in the slopes. I want to know why. Why do we have that variability? Are there some school level factors that could help explain differences in the intercepts and differences in the slopes? I don't really need to worry about trying to explain differences in the effect of family risks on reading achievement because they're the same across all schools and the variance is close to zero. Same with the effect of female. So I'm going to build another model that includes some school level predictors 
for both the intercepts and the slopes. And I'll just reiterate again what uh, Richard had said earlier. You know, model specification is something we're thinking about before we, we sit down. Okay? So it's not like I just threw these in because they would work. But. So I'm going to move forward to get to that slide. This is the model that I fit. I took my school predictors, mean SES, neighborhood climate, and public or private schools, and I included those as predictors of the intercepts and the slopes across the 169 schools. Okay, And I didn't have to worry about differences in number of family risks or differences in um, gender because those didn't vary across the 169 schools. Their, their fixed effects are still included in the model, but their variability was zero, so I don't have to model that variability. And these are the results for that model. On the, uh, uh, what side is this? Left-hand side, these are the, this is a random coefficients model. I actually changed the estimation a little bit so the m numbers are not going to be exactly the same at what, as what was on the previous slide, but they're very similar. And here is the new model. This contextual model is in the final column. So if I'm just interpreting what's happening with the intercepts, I can see that, you know, the, um, the overall intercept for these 169 schools is 56. That's the predicted reading achievement um, for uh, a school where all of these effects are at their zero point. As SES, mean SES increases by one unit, reading achievement tends to increase uh, by 6.7. As neighborhood climate worsens, reading achievement tends to decline. And for public or private schools, private schools tend to have higher reading achievement than public schools. And then if I look at the model for the SES slopes, this is really a cross-level interaction because now we're looking at how these three school variables affect the relationship between SES and math achievement. So it's affecting the uh, impact on the slope. As mean SES increases, the slope gets stronger. As neighborhood climate worsens, it really has no effect on the slope, on the effect of SES on math achievement. Um, but for private schools, uh, as um, yeah, for a private school, the effect of SES is weaker. So the value is going down. Okay, so it's in the pattern that we suspected um, based on our earlier stuff. You can see that there's a difference now in the variance. We have been able to explain a lot of the variance. Look at these numbers. They're really different. This was the original amount of variance. We've reduced it to 15. That's a large proportion of variance reduced. Our original variance in the slopes was 4. We've reduced it to 0.74. So we have been able to explain a really large amount of variability in both the intercepts and the slope for SES just using those three predictors. Exciting, isn't it? So now we'll go to... Um, my advances in, in new direction slide. This is where Richard kind of ended up as well. Uh, so I just, you know, I, I've showed you really kind of a snapshot of how one begins to think about multi-level models. But it is only a snapshot and it's only the beginning. So some different advances that are new in the field. Am I like completely out of time? One minute. Just one minute till I finish this and then we'll move on. So cross-classified and multiple membership designs. Um, uh, there's a link there that you can click on that brings up a really nice, uh, um, is it from IES? No, this one's not from IES. This was from the MLWIN people. They publish multi-level software in the UK. But it's a really nice uh, summary of different ways to look at cross-classified models and multiple membership models. Richard had uh, mentioned about multi-level um, structural equation modeling. So if you want further information on that, there's a recent article that just came out in, uh, in JEBS, uh, Journal of Education Behavioral 
statistics that summarizes a lot of that literature using a collection of surveys of um, students evaluating their teachers. Really kind of an interesting article. Um, partially nested designs are those kinds of designs that might be nested in an intervention group, like if you had a, a tutoring process set up for some intervention on reading. But in your control group, it was just individual people that you're trying to compare outcomes with. That's a partially nested design. So you have clusters on one side of the coin and no clusters on the other side. So how do we analyze that? There's a couple of different ways. Often we just treat those clusters in the control group as clusters of one and try to analyze our data best that way. But there's some adaptations to that. This is a really, um, it's like 5,000 pages long, but it's actually pretty interesting to take a look at. And it's free on the web, so that's always good. So that covers a lot of different options for partially nested designs. Um, a, a really uh, interesting aspect of neighborhood type studies or neighborhood contextual studies is the notion of spatial dependence. Neighborhoods are close to one another and so if you're looking at outcomes on even something as straightforward as reading achievement or math achievement, the neighborhoods that people live in, there's a relationship just by their uh, geographic boundary. So using some spatial dependence methods, we can actually get better estimates of neighborhood effects when we know what the location or the geography of, of those particular nests. Um, power and sample size, there's a optimal design freeware with, with a very nice manual. Um, by nice, I mean accessible to people to read. It's not all technical. Um, uh, and there's a chapter in my book with uh, Betsy McCoach um, that Jessica Spybrook sh wrote. She was one of the authors of the Optimal Design software and manual. And she walks through a lot of examples on that. So that's just some further information on sample size issues that come to play when we have um, multi-level data. And I think that's where I'm, when I'm going to end up. OK, thank you. Okay, the, the question was if you have more observed measures of a particular latent variable, is that better? Uh, I get my standard answer, it depends. I mean, there, <laughs> there is a limit. Yeah, obviously. And so partially it depends on the quality of the measures that you have. And so if I have five crappy measures, I'm still not capturing the latent variable very well. But if I had three really high quality measures, that might be all I need. And so, you know, two or less gets a little shaky. Um, you know, I can't imagine a situation where you would need eight to ten or more because, you know, that would say to me that you don't really have very good measures at all and you just need a, a big pile of them. And so, you know, if that were the case, I would be doing some preliminary analysis to see, well, what are the best measures? do that first and say, well, what are the best three or four, then, then roll those out. So if you, have like, if you have something like accelerometry and physical activity, which is sort of very much now a, a, a gold standard of moderate to vigorous physical activity, are you OK with just one measure of that? Or should you attempt to do, say, accelerometers and pedometers and get, uh, get two measures? Okay, the question was if there's sort of a gold standard measure, are you okay just using that? I would say yes. And so that would probably be what your reviewers would be expecting you to use. And so, you know, if that had minimal issues with reliability and validity and that was generally well accepted, then, you know, there wouldn't be much reason to go beyond that. And any additional measures wouldn't really help very much.
Okay, the question was, might you start with some observed variable regression models and sort of build up from there? I don't know, I think Ann and I probably would have different answers to that. I just think in terms of latent variables all the time. That's just how I think. And I think it's because of my measurement background. I'm worried about, you know, not having super high quality measures. Uh, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with doing any exploratory analysis, whether it's just playing around with observed variables or even latent variables. Because you might have a huge data set, and so you're sort of figuring out, well, what are the best measures that I could use? Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I might not do a lot of regressions, but some of my colleagues might do a lot of regressions in an exploratory phase, just to see what might be useful, and then move move to that more confirmatory stage. So there's really nothing wrong with that. That's just not how I think personally. You have a different answer, Ann? Well, I would, you know, I would agree that um, there's nothing wrong with looking at single level models or very basic models first, although I think with, uh, with multi-level models, that's probably where I would always start. Because if, if, you, if you really don't have a good understanding of what's happening, say, within different neighborhoods, within different hospitals, within different schools, you really can't start to build towards that better multi-level model. So I would say it's probably more essential with multi-level analyses, at least in the structure that I've showed here, to really develop and look at some of those single-level models. There's a lot of work being done now that really merges HLM and SEM together, but multi-level SEM is not the traditional way to that HLM has been presented or developed in, in um, either in statistical software or in people's thinking. So I think that's really an emerging trend still even now. Yeah, I have to realize, Jonathan, that Ann and I have been doing what we've been doing our whole adult lives. And so I think latent variable immediately and thinks multi-level model immediately. <laughs> Probably true. Yep, Roger. Well, the question was about interpreting results and then looking also at multiple models. And so every parameter in the model has a t value. And so, for instance, the path from x to y has certain coefficient and a certain p value associated with it. And so we know whether that relationship is significantly different from zero or not. So those are sort of micro-level hypotheses that are a piece of the larger model. Uh, in a lot of cases, we might have multiple models, either competing models, you know, there might be competing theoretical models out there, and so we can statistically compare those and say, well, this model captures the data better than this other model by comparing the fit statistics of those. Um, or if we just had a single model and then modified it, we could statistically look at whether the fit of the model improved as a result of those modifications. So those are all things that we can handle easily by, by just looking at the fit across you know, multiple models. And that's fairly common. Roger.
Okay, so the question was about uh, differences in uh, model fit statistics that might be available in the in an HLM model relative to the many, many, many that are available <laughs> in, in SEM. And uh, I would say not to that same degree. That might be good. <laughs> Although the issue in SEM is like you do have this theoretical model that you're comparing against. In multi-level modeling, typically we're comparing against some other alternative model, and so it's more like relative fit. And the, you know, HLM is a name for multi-level models in general, but it's also the name of the software that's used prominently here in the U.S. It's not the only software. The HLM software is extremely limited in what they present in terms of model fit. They, there is a deviance, and I had, did have a couple of slides on there that I scanned through. So every model has a deviance, um, which is uh, uh, similar to like poorness of fit, and comparing different types of models, you want the deviance to be smaller. And there's AIC information criteria, the AIC and the BIC criteria, but there's not um, and there's chi-square likelihood ratio tests that we can use. But unless you, as the, as the user or the researcher, are preparing this, com comparing these two specific models in the way that you like, there's not going to be the same degree of model fit criteria that are available. But the information criteria and the deviance comparisons are really what the focus is on. I did show a little bit about, or I pointed out, the reduction in variance that occurred in those school level models. That's another strategy that, that we use to see whether or not we're getting a better model by explaining variance. And there's... Is a st there a statistic there? There is a statistic, but there's not a test for it. It's just like a proportion reduction. That's what I think, yeah. 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 And then there's different R squared statistics we can calculate, or pseudo R squared, but they're not like ordinary least squares R squared, which has an F statistic. There's, again, there's no statistical test for those. And there's not really been any sampling type tests for those kinds of model fit criteria either. And it gets even worse when you think of non-continuous outcomes. The problems of claiming that a model is a good fit is much harder. Which goes back to what you know, I think we both agree on. Specifying your model up front is really the hardest part, and trying to justify that, regardless of statistical criteria, is really, that's our job you know, as researchers. I don't think everything's perfect, though, in terms of SEM with fit statistics. Yes, there are a lot of them, but only a couple of them even have an associated p-value, and so you're dependent on some subjective standard to say, well, that's, that's good enough. You know, if it's bigger than x, then that's good enough. And so, you know, neither area has really totally figured that out. That's one reason why we have so many fit statistics in SEM is they're all measuring a little bit different things, and so there's nothing that we can agree on, and so therefore you have to present a lot of them.